everybody to the February planning committee tonight. Um, this is going to be a virtual meeting. Um, we're carrying it out on Microsoft Teams. I'd just like to say that we've been having virtual meetings since last spring, and I'm sure none of us could have foretold it would be so long before we could meet each other face to face again. And we couldn't have foretold that over 100,000 of our people would have lost their lives to this virus. Um, sad news today of the passing of the inspirational Captain Sir Tom Moore. I'm sure all our thoughts are with his loved ones and with the loved ones of all who have lost their lives to this terrible virus. And we hope and pray that soon we will be able to meet together again. I'm going to explain how the meeting will be carried out. Uh, due to coronavirus, we're unable to have face-to-face -face meetings as we usually do. This is according to government advice, which says that indoor gatherings are not permitted. This is in order to keep us all safe. However, it's important that the planning process goes ahead in order to protect the economic well-being of the borough. This is in line with government advice. This is why we're continuing with planning committee meetings virtually until such time as we're able to have face-to-face -face meetings again. I assure you all that this meeting will be conducted fairly and impartially. Planning committee members are all present and will consider all evidence before us. Unlike some planning authorities, we're determined that members of the public who have registered to do so will have the opportunity to either speak or have their contributions read by an officer. This meeting will be broadcast so it may be viewed by members of the public. I'll explain the procedure of the meeting. When we consider items for decision, Firstly, the planning officer will introduce the item and give their report and presentation. Then members of the public who have registered to speak will be given three minutes to do so. After this, the applicant or their agent will have three minutes to speak. After everyone has spoken, oh, sorry, and, um, visiting councillors will have three minutes to speak also. After any, everyone's spoken, the planning officers will respond to all the points raised. Following this, the committee members will debate and decide on whether planning permission will be granted. Right, as we are likely to have these meetings for some time online, I'd like to advise you of a few guidelines to follow to make sure the meeting can be the best that we can make it. For members of the committee, it's important you can be seen, so please keep your video on at all times so I can see who's waiting to speak. If you have technical difficulties, please advise Democratic Services. If you need a brief adjournment, please let me know. The chair will decide when the debate is finished and will call for a vote. Before we vote, the head of DM, Justin, will sum up and make clear, clear what we're voting for and clarify any amendments and conditions that the committee has agreed. For residents who are registered to speak, I would ask that you keep your video and microphone off until you are called to speak and then turn them off again again after you've spoken. This is so that the network doesn't become overloaded and in order that committee members can be seen at all times. Speakers will have three minutes to speak. Um, you may only speak once. Uh, regarding this meeting specifically, um, I'd like to advise people who don't know that the first item on the agenda, Mount Echo Avenue, has been withdrawn by the applicant. So we won't be considering that item tonight. 
So the first item will be Livingstone Road and the second item will be Cooper's Lane. Okay, so if we're ready, we can start the meeting. Um, I don't think there's any apologies for absence since all the committee members are here. Um, declarations of interest. Um, I have a non-pecuniary interest that I wish to declare. Um, this is on the item in Cooper's Lane, which, as uh, some of you may know, is the road in which I live. Um, as the, I haven't had any involvement with any campaigns for or against this application. However, it is only a few yards from where I live, so I don't feel comfortable being involved in this decision. So when we get to this item, my vice chair, Councillor Littlejohn, um, we'll take the chair for for that item and I'll leave the meeting. Are there any other um, members who have an interest they need to declare? N nope. Right, can we agree the minutes of the previous meeting, which is not the m last meeting, but the uh, normal meeting? Agreed, Agreed, Chair. Can we agree there? Thank you very much. So we move straight on to item 4-2, land area of 37-39 Livingstone Road. So um, who's, is this Nikki or Theodora? Um, it's, hi Chair, it's Rebecca. It's uh, Nikki will be doing the uh, verbal update after I've done the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, Rebecca, thank you very much. So if you'd like to share your screen and um, let us know when the presentation has been taken down. Thank I will you. Do. Okay. Ready. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Thank you, Rebecca. Good evening, members of the committee. The proposal before you refers to the land to the rear of 37 to 39 Livingston Road, Walthamstow. The reference number is 202417. The application is for the demolition of the existing garages and the construction of four two-storey dwellings and one single-storey dwelling to provide five two-bedroom units with associated refuse and bicycle storage. The site refers to land immediately north of numbers 39 to 55 Livingston Road, Walthamstow. Hello, I can't hear anything. As, can other members of the committee hear the presentation? No, no. Chair. No, Chair. Vic. Yes, thank you. Sorry about this, everybody. I'll thank try you. again. Good evening, members of the committee. The proposal before you refers to the land to the rear of 37 to 39 Livingston Road, Walthamstow. The reference number is 202417. The application is for the demolition of the existing garages and the construction of four two-storey dwellings and one single-storey dwelling 
to provide five two bedroom units with associated refuse and bicycle storage. The site refers to land immediately north of numbers 39 to 55 Livingston Road, Walthamstow. The site is accessed via a driveway located between numbers 37 and 39 Livingston Road. The site is an irregular shaped plot that is currently occupied by hard standing and single storey parking garages. The property is not located within a conservation area, it's not listed and is not subject to an Article 4 direction. This is an aerial view of the site where north points to the top of the screen. The site is bound by residential properties in all directions. The surrounding area is residential in character and predominantly comprises two-storey terrace dwellings. These are photos of the application site. The top left hand corner shows the existing entrance driveway located between numbers 37 and 39 Livingston Road. The other photos show the existing single storey garages and the hard standing which would be demolished and removed as part of the scheme. Site plan shown on this slide illustrates the proposed building siting and orientation. The proposed single storey dwelling is the easternmost dwelling shown on the site plan on the right hand side of the screen. The four remaining dwellings would be two storeys. The proposed two storey dwellings are located centrally on the horizontal plane of the site, meaning the two storey buildings are set back from both the north and the south boundaries. The proposed dwellings follow the existing pattern of development of the existing terrace properties to the north and south and would not exceed the height of the existing neighbouring properties. The proposed dwellings would be dual aspect. Each dwelling would have two bedrooms. The plans also include provision for the storage of refuse, recycling and organic waste bins. This is the ground floor plan. At ground floor level, the two storey dwellings would comprise an entrance hall, open plan kitchen, living and dining space, as well as a WC and built in storage. The single storey dwelling comprises an entrance hall, open plan kitchen, living and dining space, two bedrooms, two bathrooms and built in storage space. All five dwellings also include built-in cycle storage at the front of each dwelling adjacent to the front door. These spaces will provide for two spaces per dwelling. Two of the two-storey dwellings and the single-storey dwelling would comprise one double bedroom and one single bedroom, being two bedroom, three person occupancies. The other two two-storey dwellings, being the two middle dwellings shown on this slide, would have two double bedrooms, being two bedroom, four person occupancies. All five of the proposed dwellings comply with the internal space standards for bedrooms and for the gross internal floor areas required. It is noted that there would be a shortfall in the external amenity space standards for a new terrace dwelling. However, the council considers that the proposed dwellings are not traditional terrace dwellings to which this standard would normally apply. In the context of the site limitations, the walking distance proximity of the site to nearby public parks as well as the size of the rear gardens and the relationship between the internal and external living spaces, a satisfactory standard of accommodation would be provided. This slide shows the proposed rear elevation and section drawings of the proposed first floor rear windows. The first floor rear elevation windows would comprise two angled window panes as shown at the bottom right hand side of the screen. As shown at the bottom left hand side of the screen, these windows would have a sill height of 1.25 metres and a varied sill depth from where a person would stand, where the minimum depth would be 0.4 metres and up to 1 metre in depth. When looking out the window from inside the dwelling, the right hand window pane would be obscured. The council has also recommended a condition requiring this window to be non-openable to further mitigate potential privacy impacts. All first floor rear elevation windows would be connected to bedrooms. Where there is a direct line of vision, the proposed first floor rear windows would all be separated from the first floor rear windows of the properties fronting Clarendon Road by at least 20 metres as shown on the screen. This complies with the minimum requirements. The first floor windows of the proposed front elevation are separated from the first floor rear elevations of the Livingston Road properties by less than 20 metres. However, these would not be habitable room windows and the proposed bathroom windows would be obscured. Given this, it is considered that the scheme would not result in unacceptable loss of privacy to the existing neighbouring properties. 
These are architectural renders showing the proposed development. The site is located within a controlled parking zone and the development would therefore be car free, with future residents not entitled to parking permits. The scheme would provide two secured and covered cycle storage spaces for each dwelling, which complies with the Council's cycle storage requirements. The application was supported by a daylight and sunlight report, which concluded that the development would not result in unacceptable loss of daylight or sunlight to the neighbouring dwellings. Although the scheme would have some amenity impacts to the neighbouring properties, it's considered that these impacts would not be unacceptable and would not outweigh the benefit of providing five new residential dwellings on a currently underutilised site with a PTAL rating of four. It is therefore recommended to grant planning permission for application 202417, subject to planning conditions and a section 106 legal agreement. Thank you. I have now stopped sharing my screen. Um, Nikki's now going to do a short verbal update following the update report. Hello, councillors. Uh, so there have been two updates to the to the report since it was first published the first update is we removed the uh, requirement for a con uh, the clp contribution uh, the financial contribution it from the section 106 heads of terms uh, that's because it's not applicable to minor schemes uh, the second amendment has been that we have amended condition six regarding fire access to include the requirement for fire sprinklers in this condition, uh, that's to be in line with recommended condition 20, which requires fire sprinklers prior to the occupation of the development. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Nikki. Um, I have one speaker on um, this item and um, one resident has asked for their statement to be read out by an officer. So the first speaker I have is Amanda Squire. Amanda, are you here? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, yeah, I can see. Oh, I could see you. If you put your video on, I'll be able to see you. Right, thank you. Um, you've got yeah. three minutes to speak, Amanda. Whenever you're ready, you can start your three minutes. OK, I live at 35 Livingston Road. My back garden, like number 37, runs along the end of the development. I've spoken to many of the residents whose houses back onto the development in Livingston Road and Clarendon Road. And none were in favour and most strongly opposed it. And the main concerns raised were noise, loss of outlook, loss of light, loss of privacy, overcrowding, overdevelopment, and that the new build is out of keeping with the area. So I'm going to quickly go through those noise. If the development goes ahead, we'll have the noise of five families living in a small area. The council say the noise is not significant in the context of the existing level of activity, but I say it will be significantly different. At the moment, you may hear people when they go into the back garden when the weather's fine, and that's quite different from five families living in a very small space. And you will hear them going in and out of back and front doors and you'll hear the noise of family life. Now, I don't think the council have considered how important our gardens are, given the area we live in. We live near two very busy roads and Baker's Arms Crossroads. Our gardens are a sanctuary to get away from the hurly burly noise of traffic and people. Now, the council say five properties outweigh the noise impact but the impact of noise has been underestimated for us. Then there's a loss of outlook. Views will be obstructed, but again, the importance of this has been underestimated. Outlooks are so important in built up environments and they offer respite from them. They should be highly valued and protected. Loss of light. The council say the loss of light is not unacceptable, but to residents, it is unacceptable. Loss of privacy, the council proposed non-openable windows, I understand from the plans. Won't this present a fire risk? Again, loss of privacy is unacceptable. If they can open windows, that will you know, affect privacy. If they can't open windows, that will affect them in terms of fire escape. Now, the new development is out of keeping with the area. Livingston Road and Clarendon Road 
are mainly made up of Victorian housing. The new development undermines that historical heritage. The council say it can't be seen from the road, so that's okay, but it can be seen by us, the residents. I really value the historical heritage of Walthamstow, and I'm upset that council seem intent on destroying it with all the building work that's going on, which is not in keeping with Walthamstow. I think the council is building too fast against the wishes of the residents with no equivalent increase in health services and schools, which would match the increase in population size. And I would urge the committee to listen to the residents and reject this planning application. Thank you. I can't hear you. Yeah, you're on mute. I'll mute now. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, we've got um, a resident who wanted to have a statement read. Um, do you have it, Paminda? I, I do, yes. So, one second. Yeah. I'll just get that on my screen. Uh, it's Gudrun Warnra of 27 Clarendon Road. Yeah. So. Thanks. Um, are you going to read it, Minda? Yes. yes. OK, so this is her um, written address to the committee. Um, as one directly affected by the proposed build of these houses, I and my husband would like to stress the adverse effect this has, has on us. Our private garden shall be overlooked from buildings in Clarendon Road and these new houses. It is like living in a fishbowl. Total loss of privacy. No assurances whatsoever have been given that the windows are not changed in the future or that houses are not extended upwards. Indeed, leaning out of the oriel windows guarantees a good view on one's neighbours. On my side of Clarington Road Gardens, um, the, the, the gardens back onto each other, except for a small area where the garages are. Squeezing in buildings is out of line with the neighbourhood and thereby creates a disadvantage in terms of selling one's properties. The absolute most worrying aspect is an outbreak and spread of fire. In the past, the fire brigade tackled fires in the garages entering the gardens in Clarendon Road. So a fire is not only a risk to the proposed buildings, but also a real risk to the neighbouring houses in Clarendon Road and in Livingston Road by way of spreading from outbuildings and greenery. Lastly, I would like to point out that there is no right turn from Lee Bridge Road into Ho Street. Thank you. So that is the statement from Gudrun Wanra from Clarendon Road. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, Perminda. Um, I've now got the applicant who is John Dyke of the agent? John Dyke. Access. I'm from Saddles. Um, uh, good evening. Not, Sorry. Um, uh, good when evening. are you ready, John? Thank you. Well, good evening, Chair and uh, Committee. Um, you have had a clear presentation from the officers and a very comprehensive report, so I don't want to really detail all of those aspects again, but I just want to reassure members and local residents that. The impact on neighbours and how to minimise the impact has always been at the heart of this scheme because on a tight site like this, of course, the impact we understand is of crucial importance. Um, and this scheme has been very, very carefully designed and has arisen out of pre-application advice from the officers. Um, I'm just going through some of the items raised. In terms of daylighting and sunlighting, there are accepted standards for this. They're not set by your council or any London council. They're, they are set in a national sense by the BRE. And we have provided a report which shows that acceptable daylighting and sunlighting will remain to surrounding residents according to those nationally accepted standards. Um, <clears throat> One thing that wasn't mentioned was um, the trees, and we've always been conscious that there are trees on some of the boundaries which need to be protected during construction. And so we provided a tree report to show how those will, will be safeguarded. Outlook, I know, is always an issue in overlooking and loss of privacy, which is why the design, the scheme has been designed so carefully with those particular windows designed in order to reduce the overlooking. This is a common way of doing it in tight urban areas, these angled windows with one half obscure glass. 
this is not this is designed for this site, but it is a solution which is used elsewhere. Um, as you know, the internal space standards for the houses are all met. Maximum gardens are provided. Yes, we know the importance of gardens, especially nowadays, and the maximum amount has been provided. Um, all the houses are dual aspect. They'll have PV panels on the roof, so they're energy efficient. They're made out of brick. They're not pastiche Victorian, but they are gentle, small houses, two stories, no higher than surrounding houses, built of brick. And it remains for the council to approve the type of brick as a condition. Refuse and cycle storage has been provided and a, and a construction logistics plan, which I hope will give neighbours, if you are disposed to grant permission, some reassurance that the construction will be done in a sensitive way as possible. And I think that is probably my time is up. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. Thank you, John. OK, um, I've got um, Councillor Jerry Lyons, um, who is one of the local ward councillors that wishes to speak. Jerry, whenever you're ready. Yeah, hello. Um, I do wonder about the access because if the, the um, difficulty for emergency vehicles, if emergency vehicles can't get up there, whether it be ambulances, fire brigade, whoever, um, I don't think that sprinklers are just an adequate response to that um, completely. And um, also how how the refuse is going to get collected, because, you know, we talked about the noise, but the noise of getting beings up, up one access point to the road and the difficulties that will cause um, where they're placed and all of that as well. So there is a lot of difficulties. Um, with what was access to garages now being used as access to a number of uh, of houses. And there's issues with noise for that as well, with families coming in and in and out. Um, the, I don't think it is ex acceptable when you combine the loss of light, the extra noise and the loss of view, it makes the gardens a very enclosed place for those living there, rather than, as as um, the, the speaker put it, the sanctuary away from the noise and views of of the street around streets around Baker's Arms, and um, so although that's described as not unacceptable, I would say it very much is except unacceptable to our um, residents. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Jerry. So, um, Nick, Chair, um, sorry, before you, um, before you continue, before you um, open it up to debate, um, we didn't do the committee introductions at the beginning. I think it'd be really useful just for kind of YouTube for the committee to kind of say who they are, um, because there are a couple oh, of voting members that make it clear. Who the who the committee are? Sorry, I should have reminded you sooner. I, I, did, I didn't realise. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, Minda. So I'm Councillor Jenny Gray, and I'm chair of the committee. Um, Sally. Thank you. I'm Councillor Sally Littlejohn, vice chair of the committee. Councillor Mari Pye, committee member. Councillor Keith Rayner, committee member. Uh, Alan Siggers, I'm from Sheepford. OK, thank you. So th thank those you, are Chair. the committee members. OK, sorry about that, Perminda. Um, uh, who, is it Nikki that's going to respond to the points that have been made by the residents? Yes, hello. Um, I'll, I'll provide a response, but I will open up um, afterwards just for Rebecca to add any additional comments she may have. Uh, so in terms of noise, uh, if this has been considered, uh, what have the councillors raised uh, the dragging distance of the bins to be uh, a noisy issue? 
the jogging distance, the, they are, the bins are set back nine metres from the road. Uh, so that distance does comply uh, with the council's requirements um, in the in terms of dragging distances. Uh, that's also at the front, so the that will only noise would only really affect uh, the two side properties, 37 and 39 Livingston Road, uh, if at all. And I wouldn't anticipate, given the dragging distance, to be any anything that wouldn't be normally expected with, with a residential property. In terms of additional occupancies and noise, uh, these would not be full family sized dwellings. These would not be three bedroom dwellings. They would be two bedroom dwellings. Uh, and three of those would be two bedroom, three person occupancies. So there would not be you know, four or five family households living in these. So of course there would be some additional noise, but the, this would not be unreasonable. Um, you know, five, five full families living, living in here. Uh, in terms of the gardens as well, many of the existing neighbors have are separated from the, the application site by existing outbuildings and sheds. So the, the separation distance is additional into in terms of the boundary line as well. In terms of light, uh, the applicant addressed this, but there was a sunlight and daylight report submitted that did also uh, consider overshadowing. And those reports do show that all of the BRE standards are met. Uh, in, that's for all of the neighbouring dwellings, internal and in their gardens as well. I uh, just want to clarify, someone did raise uh, with the windows uh, in terms of fire safety in concerns if the windows are fixed shut. Uh, to be clear, the condition recommended would only require the obscured pane to be fixed shut. Uh, the non-obscured pane would be openable under the current conditions and proposal. The obscured and uh, requested to be fixed shut window, that is those the way they're arranged, those windows are closest to the boundaries. Uh, in terms of the heritage and the issues raised around character, this site is not in a conservation area. Of course, we do need to consider um, the history of the area, but it's not in a conservation area, so that is not a material consideration for, for this application. There are also many similar developments across the bar, and they are becoming more and more uh, increasingly increasingly developed these backland sites. Uh, the site does meet all the policy requirements uh, in terms from the London plan as well as our local plan, the uh, core strategy and development management plans in terms of the siting, uh, in terms of it being a underutilised brownfield site and being in a PTAL of three, sorry, four. In terms of fire access, uh, this, this was raised. The application was referred to the London Fire Brigade. Uh, they did recommend a condition be, be included in the decision notice. That would be around fire access uh, and meeting the building regulations, which would be um, which would be required and has been recommended. The recommendation of the condition for fire sprinklers, the fire sprinklers are not at all intended to be um, a solution to a to a fire um, safety problem. Those the installation of the fire sprinklers are to ensure that the fire can be kept under control until the fire brigade can access the site. Uh, in terms of outlook as well, of course there would be there would be some impacts. There's going to be a build. There would be a building where there wasn't a building before. Uh, but the siting of the buildings on the site, uh, as well as as well as the height and the um, and the design we, and the setback from the boundaries, it wouldn't be considered to be completely detrimental impact to the neighbours. Um, I will ask now if Rebecca or Justin have anything that they would like to add to that. Thanks, Nikki. Um, if I'd just um, probably reiterate the same thing that Nikki has already said, but in terms of noise, um, the env uh, Council's Environmental Health Noise Team actually raised no objections in terms of the um, proposed development. And although there would be, we acknowledge additional residential units on the site, that we, that wouldn't cause a significant level of additional noise and disturbance in, in an urban setting. Um, in terms of outlook, um, as Nikki has already said, um, yes, they would. The near dwellings would be visible from from the nearest other properties, um, but a change doesn't necessarily mean it's a would cause material harm. So existing views 
um, from the rear gardens or from the upper windows would be of the property, but the nearest windows are actually around 15 metres away. Um, in terms of daylight sunlight, yes, it is BRE compliant. Um, I think Nikki's covered the condition about windows and access. Um, I'd just say in terms of emergency vehicles and fire safety, it's very similar to other backland sites that have been approved at committee in the last six to eight months in terms of access for the fire brigade. The fire brigade can access the site from the road um, the, the whole of the whole of the development falls within the oh you can't see my hands a 40 the 45 degree arc for the hoses if the um, vehicle was parked at the entrance to the road so they can access the whole of the site from the road and um, with their hoses and that's um, the advice we've had from our own building control team as well but the sprinklers are there as Nikki has said as an additional safety and the refuse is already been covered by Nikki thank you Thank you very much, Rebecca. OK, um, I will refer this to the committee now. And I have Councillor Keith Rayner has his hand up. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to recover two points here uh, on uh, window access and overlooking. In terms of the drawings I have in front of me, one's on page 37 and the other one's the overall drawing, which shows up on my group of papers as page 31. Um, we've identified the fact that from both the ground floor and the first floor, there would be windows. Um, we've identified very clearly that the window from the upstairs bathroom and toilet would be fixed and frosted so it wouldn't obscure. And I'm prepared to accept that on the ground floor, uh, just at the beginning of the stairwell, uh, there would be a window which would probably come below fencing line. But on the first floor, um, including above the stairwell and at the top of the staircase on the first floor itself, there are two other windows as well. Um, they do not look like they are both fixed and obscured um, so very clearly there is still an overlooking aspect to this that isn't necessarily identified um, in terms of the fire access um, I, I would like a bit of clarity please because um, as far as the officers are concerned and I think Councillor Lyons brought this up as an issue when he spoke um, having a, um, a fire protection system of some description, in this case sprinklers, um, how are those uh, sprinklers supplied? For instance, if they come off of the individual water supply within the building and something, say, like a fire starts in the kitchen, which is one of the more probable areas it might start, Will that affect the water supply, which in then in turn affects the sprinkler system? How long is it expected to see that the sprinkler system would control or hold back the fire whilst, quote, the fire brigade came in attendance? And what is the full length of that driveway? Because very clearly um, it's been originally done to take motor vehicles but I strongly suspect you could never get a fire engine down there. So you're going to have to have at least an engine that is not just a pump engine, but also comes with ladders and hoses. So I'd be interested to see what we think in terms of how that's all going to figure out and come together. OK, thank you, Councillor Rayner. Um, I've Councillor Pye has her hand up, so I'll ask the officer to come back after Councillor Pye has spoken. Councillor Pye. Thank you, Chair. I was just checking through my notes. Um, I'm usually quite a fan of these backland infill developments, but I, ha I actually have some quite significant concerns about this one. It's a very constrained site. It's a very strange shape. And I'm just worried that there is 
maybe a compromise too far being made in relation to this one. Um, there's those issues that a lot of people have pointed out with the fire vehicles access and concerns expressed by the fire brigade. Planning condition recommends sprinklers, but I don't quite understand why. If Rebecca's saying the hoses can reach, then why do they need the sprinklers? And if there is a reason they need the sprinklers, that always worries me because we can ensure they're put in, but we can't ensure they're maintained. In 10 years' time, who knows whether those sprinklers will work or not? And a fire you know, could happen at any time in the next 50 years. Um, and I think relying on sprinklers, it always makes me a bit nervous. But when you add together the other issues on this site, it's the, it's the cumulative um, range of issues that I think I'm concerned about. As Councillor Rain has pointed out, there are an awful lot of non-opening and obscure windows because of privacy and the shape of the site. And these are not just bathrooms, but also include hallways and stairwells and habitable rooms. I'd like to know from officers exactly how many there are in the worst affected house. How many obscured windows are there? Exactly which rooms are they in? And how many non-opening windows are they? And which rooms are they in? 10.1a in the report, and it is a really comprehensive report, which I'm very grateful for. So I'm afraid there's quite a lot for us to get our teeth into. 10.1a makes it clear that none of the first floor elevation windows meet the requirement that habitable room, habitable room windows overlooking private gardens will need to be set back five metres per storey from the common boundary. Now, we justify this by saying that they have a special design of window sills. Well, I've never come across that one before. And that they are bedrooms. Well, you know, people still look out of their bedroom windows just as much as anywhere else. And I, I don't really think that's adequate. And I'd like more information, particularly about these this bizarre thing about, well, it's all right not to be five metres because the window sills are quite wide. Um. And then 10.2a says that all of the proposed dwellings fall short of um, DM7, outdoor space requirement for terrace houses. Now, we were told just now by Nikki that this scheme met all of the requirements. Well, there's two that it doesn't meet that we've I've identified just going through the report. So I'd like to know how we are justifying the fact that there's not enough outdoor space in terms of the uh, requirements on this one. And why have we not asked for a landscaping plan and landscaping management plan in the conditions to ensure that the very small space that there is is at least well set out and possibly a little bit of um, you know, tree planting or something to alleviate some of those problems that the neighbours have got? I, I think that's all from me for now, but I'm, I may want to come back after officers have, have come back because I'm really, I really am not very happy with this one. Thank you. I'll just take Councillor Littlejohn and then I'll ask Nikki to back. Councillor Littlejohn. Thank you, Chair. Um, my concerns are similar to everybody else's and I just wonder about these strange windows. Um, it seems like a, a, yeah, a compromise too far and a very odd arrangement, um, these upstairs bedroom windows looking out over, is it Clarendon Road? Um, and I just wonder, were there any other solutions sought for that? I'm also concerned about the the amenity space, although I think it meets, I think it meets one standard, but it doesn't meet our forest standard, and um, that concerns me because amenity space, especially in the city where we you know we do live cheek by jowl, and as um, I think it was Amanda said, you know we do appreciate our gardens. People who have gardens there already appreciate their gardens and the people who come to live in these houses will want um, gardens of a decent size. So um, I'm concerned about those two things. And I do wonder whether, you know, the, the applicant considered some different arrangement so that a, there was a more amenity space made available, possibly a smaller number of dwellings on this site and also that the, this odd window arrangement could be um, different somehow. A different solution could be found. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Sigurds, I can see that you're waiting to speak, but I think I've got so many questions for the officers to come back on. 
Um, if it's okay with you, I'll ask them to respond to the questions uh, that they've got now, and then I'll bring you in. If that's um, okay. Uh, Nikki um, and Rebecca, if you'd like Thank to... Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm going to start. I think I've and, uh... been one job. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to start and then I'll pass over to probably Nikki and then Justin's going to jump in as well. Um, in terms of the fire safety issue that we that has been raised a few times, um, it is a very similar arrangement to that on um, Orford Road, the backland site that went, came through committee maybe six, eight months ago on Orford Road, um, where the access road, the access to the backland site is not wide enough for a fire vehicle to access, uh, to get down. And so the fire brigade um, in that instance um, on Orford Road and the same here, we are requesting a condition relating to the sprinklers so that that covers the initial start and to give the fire brigade time to get to the site and access the site from the road. The distance from the front of the road to the back of the site is about 23 metres and it falls within the 45 degree arc. The whole of the site falls within the 45 degree arc so, so the fire brigade will be able to reach the site with their hoses from the road but the sprinkler system is the like the first first response if that makes sense um, so very similar to that site and also um, I think it was a Vicarage Road site as well where again the access way wasn't wide enough and um, the conditions that were put on related to sprinklers and then the fire brigade will access the site from the road um, in terms of the windows I'm going to leave Nikki to come back on that one because she knows all of the windows um, the urban environment in terms of the setback it's ve again very similar to other backland sites that we've dealt with in the borough the um, urban design guidance sets out some guidance on what the setback should be from the boundaries however that um, isn't always able to be followed to the letter in a close urban environment and on other schemes the setback from the boundary has also been less than the five meters per story so and one of the ways to try and overcome that on this site was the introduction of the oriel windows with the obscure glazing on half the window but clear glazing on the other half of the window but i will leave nikki to come back on the details of the windows um the rear garden the two the smallest unit would meet the garden size for a um, two bedroom flat. It's the single story unit. Um, the others, again, the amenity standards meet the London plan standards, but they don't meet the Waltham Forest standards. But there are um, two parks, I think, detailed in the report within 10 minutes, um, but we they are London plan compliant and we can add a landscaping condition if the committee decide that's necessary. I will pass over to Nikki now to talk about the windows then I think Justin might come in some more on the issue of fire. Thank you. When are you on mute, ready? Nikki? <laughs> Happens to the best of us. Um, so uh, yes, I'll speak about the windows and I'll try there. So there are a lot of questions, so I've hoped I've noted down all of them. Uh, the windows we have considered to be quite a clever design solution to what is, as you have all pointed out, a, a very odd, oddly shaped site and a very restricted site. The first floor windows, uh, so each flat would have, each of the, sorry, each of the two story flats would have um, two first floor level windows on the front elevation. One of those would be a bathroom window, which would be obscured. The other would not be obscured, uh, but that would be a hallway window. Um, so in the staircase, so that would that's not a habitable space. That's not a space that we would normally consider as somewhere that people would be spending a lot of time. So we would not consider that to have overlooking concerns. Um, also note that that window does, uh, as Councillor pointed out, that would roughly align with, uh, with the fence height and would not significantly look on top of that. Uh, there was a discrepancy in the original submissions. Um, I will note that on the floor plans, they did show three windows, uh, but it was assessed as two and the, applic the um, applicant has since submitted amended plans, but they did come through too late for them to be included um, in the submission, but that has been clarified um, and those three windows shown were an error. 
Um, so it would be the two to consider. Uh, in terms of the rear elevation windows, um, they would all be connected to bedrooms. Each dwelling would have two windows, so that would be a total of eight of these uh, 45 degree angled windows. Uh, the sill height of those would be 1.25 metres, um, and the they would have a sill depth up to one metre, which would be if you are standing looking out of this window, you are one metre from the from the end of the window. Uh, so although there, there are non-compliances in terms of the setbacks of these windows and these elevations, we need to remember that there is an additional one metre from the inside where a person could stand. Um, the only way to get closer would be to physically climb into that window, uh, which would not be something we would reasonably expect somebody to be doing. Um, those window panes uh, were as you're standing in the window, the right hand window pane would be obscured. That was part of the original scheme and we have recommended the condition to have that window to be fixed shut as well to add further mitigation measures to the privacy concerns. The left hand window pane would not be obscured and would not be uh, fixed shut and it wouldn't be reasonable to expect that both of them would be, uh, both for fire safety concerns and to ensure that a reasonable amount of light and ventilation does get into the bedrooms uh, to ensure a, a reasonable internal living environment. Uh, in terms of the justifying the outdoor amenity space, uh, Rebecca did touch on this a little bit, but I would just like to further add, uh, in the report where it says it doesn't comply with the council's standards, these standards of 50 square metres are for for a regular terrace dwelling that seems to be the the intention of this and these are not regular terrace dwellings so the fact that they do not comply with the 50 square meters is not considered to be unreasonable uh they would this all of the dwellings would comply with the requirements for a two store uh, sorry a two bedroom flat although they're not flats uh they're also not traditional terrace dwellings so to have something in between uh we can consider to be quite reasonable uh, and in terms of the landscaping, as Rebecca said, that is something we could certainly add a condition um, around adding landscaping and um, providing buffering, screen planting, um, something to that effect to, to further mitigate those privacy impacts uh, and to also increase the amenity to the future occupants. Uh, I will also add that the living space um, in all of the dwellings does come off the internal living space and there is a bifold door proposed. So that would, the outdoor living space is essentially an extension of the internal living space, uh, which would sort of expand, expand the opportunities for use and be able to, especially in the summer months, um, be, be a joined living space, internal and outdoor environments for, for the future occupants. I'll pass over to Justin now, see if he has anything to add. Uh, thank you, Nikki. Yeah, I was just going to pick up on the point about the maintenance right. of um, of the uh, sprinkler system, um, which is something that has been raised pre uh, previously as well on other schemes. Um, and um, I think, I mean, our view is that it would be, uh, obviously the, the long-term maintenance is important, but it would be similar to um, uh, kind of other elements of the insulation around the, around these houses that are required by building regulations that have to be maintained um, uh, you know throughout the lifetime of the of the um, of the the occupation of the dwellings um, and uh, the, the, the 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 sprinkler system would be um, a British standard compliant uh, water suppression system so you know would be required to comply to a recognized standard which we could um, specify that add that detail into the condition as well. Thank you. Right, thanks, um, Justin. Um, I'll take Councillor Siggers now. Thanks for waiting, Alan. Hey, OK, that's lovely. Um, I've got to be honest, I wasn't that... There were aspects of this I didn't particularly like. But as offices have continued, I've become more and more concerned. Um, I mean, Nikki was just talking about, oh, these are not traditional, these are not normal terraced houses. We're in, in the first place, I'm pretty sure our policy doesn't say that. I think it says a two-storey dwelling. Um, it doesn't define 
whether it's a, a I don't think exactly if these are not normal terrace houses, then why are they? I mean, obviously their location is not normal, but they are normal terrace houses. Um, it's it's as though we're trying to shoehorn, and and again, you know, the idea that well, um, oh, we've done this elsewhere, so this is fine. Um, I'm pretty sure that one of the things we do, we always say is that each application has to be considered on its own merits. You can't just say, well, we did this here, so it's okay there. I mean, Orford Road was, was brought out. Now, I'm pr fairly certain that the access to Orford Road is not as long and as narrow as this is. So I don't think it's quite the same thing at all. Um, I am... One of the, my biggest issue around this, I think, was and still is, um, we are supposed to be building sustainable dwellings. And what that means is that it has sustainable in all, in, in, from all facets of its use. Refuse collection is part of that. Um, you know, if we're really going to talk about what we've done, but we have refused a long time ago, but we have refused applications because refuse collection facilities were not adequate and we have got standards um, for uh, refuse distancing and what our standards say is that you you should not carry a bag a, a sack of waste more than 25 meters and you should not drag a bin more than nine meters now it's our standard we 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 came up with that. Um, this, wherever you put this, um, wherever you put this, this what this uh, refuse storage area, you're not going to hit those standards. Simple as that. Um, so that's that's one point. Another problem I have, which is kind of glossed over in the report, is lighting. Now the police have said bollard lighting's no good, but so we, we've been asked to make a decision here on uh, a, a backhand development with a very narrow gutted little access, which at this moment in time is completely dark. Now, I don't think that's a particularly good thing. Secondly, one of the issues with putting in lighting for this area is we're going to create light pollution and at the moment we as a committee have no idea how that thing's going to be lit now that's important from a from a, a safety point of view from, from the residents it's important from a designing out crime and yet we have no information on that whatsoever and i, I think that's a that's a, a that's a big problem for me because i don't like making decisions unless i know what it is we're dealing with um so and and if that lighting is put in whose responsibility is it i mean mari might ask the question quite reasonably how, how are the the sprinkler systems going to be uh, maintained just in saying well it's going to be down to the individuals who's going to maintain the street lighting who's going to maintain the communal area lighting because these are going to be freeholds so is this something the council does? Is this something, you know, we, we've got no information on this whatsoever. And because of its location, and purely because of its location, this was on the street, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But it's not. It's down an alley, round the back of buildings. Um, I don't like, I don't, don't, don't really like the way we breeze over this overlooking thing. Yes, we live in an urban environment, I get that, and almost everything is going to overlook something else. But again, you know, I go back to points that, that colleagues have made. We've got obscure glass. We've got windows that you can't open. If we have to design a building where you cannot see out the windows and you can't open the windows, the question has to be asked, should we be doing this? It's really questionable. It, to, to me, anyway, um, fire, yes, all right. I mean, 
Um, Sprint two systems do work. They they do they do do the job they're meant to do. Um, as Keith rightly said, we're not going to you know a, a, a fire tender's not going to get up there. Um, you, there's something you can do about that because you can put you could build a hydrant in further down. You could have sprinkler systems, which are great. I'm actually more concerned by ambulances. Now, I notice in the report what it says is, well, we're going to take away one of the car parking spaces. Um, I bet all the residents that pay for those CPZ places are over the moon about that. And you can get an ambulance in to the end. So you can park an ambulance on the street. But it also says, I think I'm right in saying, I think I remember this, right, that there's going to be a gate across the front at, at the... Um, in line with the with the primary elevation so you know this all speaks to me of delay and there is nothing you can do about that you know the, the, you, you can suppress a fire you can but but if somebody's just had you know a heart attack or something there's nothing you can put in that dwelling that's going to get you a, 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 a um, paramedics to you any quicker um and I, I find that very, you know, I find that concerning. It goes to, to me, it goes to sustainability. We are supposed to be passing stuff that is sustainable. Here we are, we are virtually performing origami with our policies to make them fit this um, development. And I don't think they do. Um, I mean, as um, I can't remember, it was somebody said the answer. Very comprehensive report. There's, a, there's quite a detail, quite a detailed um, uh, design and access statement. Um, but there's what what you notice is when you get a lot of information, what you concentrate on is information you don't get, and it's that I find that that gives me real pause with this. Um, I'm I came into this thinking that, well, okay, you know, it's another backbone development. I personally don't like them, but you have to have grounds for saying no. Uh, but this one, I think we really are being asked to abandon, abandon a lot of our the purposes that we sit on this committee for. So um, I'd like to, I would like to know if we've got anywhere at all with any kind of um, lighting for this area. And um, I'm deeply, I, there's nothing, I've heard all the arguments about windows and stuff, but I'm not, I'm not happy with it. I really am not. Thank you very much, Chair. Hang on, what have I done? Right, thank you, Councillor Sigurds. Um, before I ask the officer to come back, Councillor Littlejohn has her hand up. Thank you, so Chair. Did you have another question? Well, I just I did ask a question earlier that didn't get a response. Um, I mean, officers may think it's inappropriate for me to ask. Um, were any other designs considered? For example, maybe fewer dwellings or dwellings where the upstairs windows did not face directly, um, did not overlook directly into other properties. Um, yeah, questions like that that you know maybe would have made this site. Um, well, we could have used this site in, a, in a, a way that's more acceptable, put it that way. Thank you. I can come on back on that one if that's OK, Councillor. Okay. Um, the in, yeah, that's in, okay. Sorry. Um, there is um, in the relevant site history section of the report. Sorry, I haven't got a um, agenda as such, so I'm not entirely sure which page number it's on. Um, it's section five of the report there was um the only history we've got is for pre-application advice which was for demolition of the garages and and construction of six houses um so there was a another scheme and it was a bigger scheme than the scheme that we've got before us so this is a, a reduced size scheme compared to what we've looked at previously but um uh, yeah that's the only history that we've got on the site 
Um, and just in relation to, there's a question about lighting for Councillor Siggers. Um, the um, condition 24, I think it is, um, relates to the secure by design um, standard. And that's one of the things that would need to be covered for them to be able to get signed off for the secure by design would be details of lighting. So usually lighting is something that's dealt with by way of condition rather than um, at the application stage. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, all right, does anybody have any more questions or comments or does anybody want to move anything? I'd like to move that we, um, we vote, Chair. I'd like to... Um, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not well, moving to like vote to on officer to vote for the officer's recommendation. Put it that way. So you're moving officer's recommendation? No, I'm not. Or the. Sorry. So you're moving that we don't grant planning permission for this development? Yes. I'm sorry if I've if I've gone. Oh, okay. Thanks. I've done this in a. In I a think I've had too many planning committees lately. <laughs> my brain. Right, so I have had it moved that um, planning um, permission not be granted for this. Is that seconded? Uh, that's seconded by Councillor Siggers. Um, right, okay. I mean, I just say a few things. Um, I mean, I have no problem with what's being moved at all. And I'm a real fan of developing garage sites, as you all know. Um, however, we have got to make sure that we build something of quality. And I don't want to see this site left as a um, scabby pile of garages that is a waste of space. I mean, I'm amazed that um, there was um, an application for six houses um, after having visited the site. I'd be very surprised if that would ever be considered. And I think that there is opportunity to develop this site, but I think maybe this is a step too far. And if there were fewer dwellings or if they were a single storey, if there was... Um, different configuration in the um, windows, then I don't think that there would be an issue with granting this. I mean, it's not the principle of development. It's just the committee seems to feel that this is um, a step too far. And I know that we have agreed backlog developments in the past few months. But in the last couple of years since I've been chair of the committee and when um, other councillors have been on the committee, we've also refused backlot sites for similar reasons to this. And every application must be looked at as its merits, um, whether there are planning grounds to refuse this or... Um, whether there are not and I think in this case it is just a little bit too much and they would benefit by um, going back and looking at something a bit more appropriate. Um, Justin, do you want to come in before I move to the vote? You don't have to. Uh, I mean I, I, I... I mean, all I'd, I suppose I'd say, you know, the, the mayor's policy on small sites does encourage the use of um, sites, brownfield sites like like this, um, to kind of contribute to the housing supply. Um, and uh, you know, whilst yeah, it, this, this, the scheme does meet space standards um, and and has dealt with uh, sought to deal with overlooking, um, you know, it is acknowledged it doesn't meet the the um, the amenity space standard in the in the local plan. Um, and but it has you know has dealt with issues around fire safety and refuse access as well. You're on mute, chair. 
Right, I want, I'm going to move to the vote now, but I want it to be clear on the if this is refused, um, what planning grounds it is proposed to refuse it under. I mean, I have um, concerns about fire safety, um, inadequate outdoor amenity space overlooking. Were there any more? Emergency access chair, not just for the fire brigade, but as Alan said earlier, okay. ambulances as well. Right. The landscaping issue. Uh, I'm very concerned about the fact that we don't seem to have up to date plans in front of us because it's been clearly identified there's been a number of plans changed. I think it's also very clear that the lighting issue needs to be defined possibly as part of a planning condition, as opposed to something that's just smuggled in as part of a general condition. And I'm also very clear that at the end of the day, the issue um, of overlooking versus what windows are locked, closed or permanently sealed or frosted needs to be looked at quite seriously again. Um. If I can. Yeah. Um, I've got Councillor Little John and Councillor Pye and Councillor Siggers as well. Um, uh, Councillor Little John. Thank you, Chair. I just want to say about the windows. Um, there is an amenity, internal amenity aspect around these windows, some of which are obscured and some of which are non-openable. And this odd, these odd windows where you can't even really get very close up to them. It seems. Um, I think that's quite a defect, actually, in terms of, um, you know, just being a resident in the house and having to use those rooms. Thank you. Maybe, maybe she's covered. Thank you. Anyway, yeah. Right. Thank you. The, um, Councillor Pye, can you come up with any other planning grounds? I was going to come back to that one that Sally said. I do think it is very important that we're not just looking at the issue around um, the remedial steps being inadequate that are put in there for overlooking, but also the impact on, on, on the residents of the new properties of those. That was my major concern. I don't think anybody should have to have one metre deep window sills just to stop them looking into their neighbour's garden. Um, I think we just need to be a bit careful and maybe seek officers' advice in relation to emergency vehicles. Um, most ambulances will tell you that these days paramedics arrive on motorbikes. I think that can get up there. Um, so let's just be a little bit careful on that one. But I do think we need to look into the issue that Councillor Siggers raised in terms of refuse, because I know there is a limit uh, that our refuse collectors will only pick up from up to nine metres, um, that where they're not contracted to pick up from any further than that. We could have a long term issue here that the bins don't get emptied if it were to go ahead. Right, thank you, Councillor Siggers, and then I'm going to move to the vote. Okay, um, Mara is quite right. They do, uh, you do get paramedics turn up motorbikes, but nobody's getting in anywhere if, they, if there's a gate across the front, are they? Um, I think we are contrary to po uh, policy DM32. Uh, it offers a poor standard of accommodation for um, future occupiers and doesn't manage the impact on on uh, neighbourhoods. Um, we're also contrary to DM7 in terms of amenity space. It does state that the amenity space should be usable. And I think the single floor unit at the end um, is, does not have usable space at all. Um, so, uh, and basically, I think we, we as a committee, we're not presenting with enough information. I take Rebecca's point. Yes, there is a condition that says you know, we will sort out your lighting later, but we as a committee should be, we should have that information. That should have been done beforehand, in my view. Um, so that's all I've got for you, sorry. Okay, thanks very much. So I think that's pretty clear. Councillor Pye, do you want to come back? Because you've still got your hand up. No, okay. Then it is moved and seconded that planning permission not be granted for the Livingstone Road application um, on grounds of um, the 
has been set out that I know that Justin has written down. So can you say what they are, Justin, please, for clarity? Um, uh, yeah, so I've got fire safety, um, the uh, absence of a landscaping plan, um, overlooking insufficient amenity space, um, uh, creation of a of a poor living environment as a result of the combination of uh, obscured and non-opening windows. Um, the uh, the potential impact of lighting. Um, just on the bins, um, uh, the 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 refuse point would be within. Um, the, the 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 maximum distance from the street that, that our refuse team will accept. So I'm, I'm not sure that would be an appropriate reason for refusal. Uh, what about the fact that that probably means it's on the other side of somebody's boundary fence to their back garden? And what would that bring during the summer? It's uh, If I can jump in there, Councillor Rayner, it's actually um, not against a boundary fence it's um in the access road against a flank wall i can put the plan i can show the plan up that was in the presentation if you need to see it again accepted chair accepted uh, no, on, I, th I think we're probably done just on that point um just, i've got the speaker's hand up sorry we just really want that, to move to the venue. yeah i know you do jenny let's just deal with this yeah uh, i know on the yeah. on the point of that uh of refuse justin Yes, it's close enough to the to the road for the drag distance, but it's not close enough to the houses to carry the, the crap down there. That's be, it's beyond our standards. That's 25 metres. That's more it actually, yeah. Sorry, Councillor Siggers, it is within 25 metres of the houses as well. Within the, the, the front, front of the site from front to back is only 23 metres from the road to the back of the site. Uh, well, then the drawings are wrong. Because using the scale bar that comes with the drawings, it ain't even close to that. So something's amiss somewhere. Um, and can I just actually, can I just throw one more in, please, real quick? Um, I think it's out of character with the area. I don't think it's, I don't think it's in keeping with the character of the area. So. Can I just. That's can a condition. Um, Councillor Pye, and then I'm taking a vote. Just one thing, Justin, when you were. Yeah, when Justin was going through the DM32 issues, you mentioned the obscure glass and the non-opening windows. The other one is those window sills, I'm afraid. One meter oh, to yeah. window sills. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I, as much as I've agreed with Council Seagulls on everything else tonight, I don't agree about it not being in character with the area. Often they're not, and that can complement an area. There's lots of other reasons we've got on this one. All right, fair enough. Okay. So can I have all those in favour of what has been moved and seconded, which is that planning permission not to be granted for Livingstone Road. All those in favour. So that's unanimous. So oh, I don't often have to say this. So um, planning perm permission has not been granted for Livingstone Road. Thank you all. Um, Councillor Pai, you Still got your hand on. Hand up. I was no. going to ask if, as we're having a chair swap, can we also have a two-minute comfort break because we've been going for nearly an hour and a half? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Have we really? Gosh. So I will um, leave the chair now because I've declared an interest in Cooper's Lane. So um, two minutes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair.
move on then to item 4.3, which is um, the development at Cooper's Lane. Now, which officer is presenting this item? Um, I'll share the presentation, Chair, and then Theodore and myself will deal with uh, questions. Thank you. Um, can you, I just want to remind you, I think you know well enough um, to just announce when you're putting the presentation up and taking it down again. I will do. I do it every month. So, yes. I know. I know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I'll share my, pres my screen now with the presentation. We're not seeing it. It came and it went. Good evening, Chair and members of the planning committee. This application is for the erection of two two-bedroom dwellings. The application is brought to committee to be determined due to the level of public interest received, which is summarized in the report. The application site is located on the south side of Cooper's Lane. It is a rectangular plot occupied by six vacant garages. The site is not located in a conservation area and the buildings on site are not listed. The plot is surrounded by the rear gardens of two-storey residential dwellings on Brewster Road and it fronts two-storey terrace houses on the opposite side of Cooper's Lane. The area is characterised with two-storey Victorian dwellings, similar in scale and design, with good-sized rear gardens. The application proposal is for a pair of semi-detached dwellings. The houses would be two storeys in height with pitched roof design. The buildings would be traditional in appearance. The windows and front entrances would match the design and proportions of the Victorian terrace on the opposite side of the road. The existing garages make neutral to negative contribution to the street scene. The proposed dwellings would have an attractive appearance and would enhance the street scene. To limit the impact from a proposal on sunlight and daylight to neighbouring properties, the Urban Design SPD recommends a minimum clearance of 12 metres between the window of a habitable room and the blank flank wall of an opposing two-storey building. The proposed dwellings are located at approximately 11 metres from number 21 to 22A Brewster Road and 12 metres from number 99 to 105 Cooper's Lane. The proposed dwellings are two storeys in height with the roof swapping down to a single storey at the rear. The relationship between the application proposal and the houses to the rear of the site is not much different to that between number 21 Brewster Road and their garage outbuilding. Given the scale and proportions of the dwellings, the development complies with the Urban Design SPD and it's unlikely to have a detrimental impact on nearby residents in terms of loss of daylight or sunlight. The proposed dwellings would contain windows to habitable rooms in their front and rear elevations. To protect the privacy of residential occupiers, the Urban Design SPD advises that a minimum distance of 20 metres is required between opposing windows of habitable rooms. This would not apply to facing windows across the public highway. The living conditions of the occupiers of Brewster Road would not be affected as a result of the development proposed. Views from the ground floor windows would be restricted by the proposed two metre boundary treatment. The windows in the first floor serve a landing and a bathroom and are obscured, therefore removing the potential for overlooking. The front facing windows and gardens of properties on Corpus Lane are already overlooked from the street. Given the gap between the application site and neighbouring properties on Corpus Lane, it's unlikely that existing occupiers would experience an acceptable loss of privacy through overlooking. 
the proposal would exceed the internal space standards. And although it won't be strictly policy compliant in terms of external amenity space, the development provide usable private gardens for each dwelling, which is considered on balance acceptable. Policy DM7 advises that the Council will take a flexible approach when applying the external space standards. In this case, the site is suitably located within 0.2 miles from Jack Cornwall Park and 0.3 miles from Leighton Sports Grounds and Abbott's Park. As such, officers are satisfied that the future occupiers of the dwellings would have access to a variety of outdoor spaces within a short distance from their homes. In summary, the proposed residential development is on balance considered to be acceptable in terms of design, massing and visual amenity. The development would make an efficient use of land and provide acceptable internal living arrangements for future occupiers. It is considered there would be no harmful impact on the amenity of neighbouring residents nor the character of the street. As such, the recommendation is for approval, subject to the conditions and the Section 106 agreement as set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll sh stop sharing my screen now and pass over to Teodora for a verbal update. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Good evening. OK, um, just one second. OK, um, verbal update. Since the publication of the committee report, a typographical error has been noted in the proposed development description. The description for each proposed dwelling house should state two bedroom dwelling. The 5% monitoring fee has been removed from paragraph 1.1 as it is not required for proposals which do not involve financial contributions. Paragraph 12.1 is amended and the phrase commercial floor space removed. Condition 5 is also amended to include covered cycle, story, cycle storage for four cycles. The air quality and dust management plan condition referenced in paragraph 10.56 is added as condition 27. Um, officer's recommendation has not changed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Teodoro. Thanks. OK, we have two members of the public who wish to speak. Mr. Mohammed Patel, are you here? Yes, I am. Would you Thank like you. to speak? You have three minutes. OK, thank you very much, committee. And good evening. My name is Mr. Mohammed Patel. I am a resident at 21 Brewster Road. Um, obviously, this has been an ongoing saga in the fact that this is a second planning different development in terms of different diagrams being submitted. The first ones have been rejected. My concerns are mostly to do with the fact that my garden is less than 30 metres away from the actual building it's going to be intended to be built. And it's going to affect my boundary wall in terms of a neighbour's garden. And therefore, I have an infringement of privacy and immediate space and overcrowding and noise, being a two bedroom dwelling. I'm also concerned about the overlooking and the fact that my garden will overlook theirs and also their property will look into my front first floor building and so forth. In terms of out of character, well, the property seems to be in character with the rest of the properties around Cooper's Lane. However, this will set a precedence with a number of properties being developed further down the future in terms of from 63 to 103, because currently there's no properties being built on the back of people's houses or back of gardens or back of garages. And therefore we believe in the long term for sustainable economics of a building and the, and the over, overlooking of a property is going to be out of character and people end up building further properties. So based on those reasons, I'm actually rejecting the fact that this planning should not go ahead. I'm probably more acceptable to the fact it should be a single, swelling, single dwelling property with a single floor, maybe a bungalow. But in terms of visual aesthetics and invasion of privacy and overcrowding and a meeting space, these two properties will not meet those requirements. And for that reason, I am opposed about it. I understand that the council have a duty of care in terms of building new properties and trying to make 
sustainable areas for everybody to live in, but not at the cost of people's well-being and mental health. And I don't think you can put a price on people's mental being and well health for that reason. And for that reason, we are extremely concerned at 21 Brewster Road. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Patel. Um, we have also a Mr. Maloney. Hello. Hello. I am Please. Mr. Maloney. I live, I live at 22A Brewster Road. I've been there for over 20 plus years. What I'm really concerned about here is the, is the view outside the back of my house from the top floor, from the bottom floor, the lighting that comes in in the morning, even if the sun is not up, the lighting that's going to, is coming in there is, will, will be disturbed. And I am just, I, I just can see a colossus of a, of a property behind, the view will change completely behind my house. The view across the, the, the back of my garden to the houses with the chimneys and various things, all of this will be destroyed. There's a tree there, there's a wildlife is there that has developed over the years. I'm concerned that that will be disturbed tremendously. Um, my neighbors have already knocked on my door saying, Len, this is what's happening, and they are disturbed. I, I just think this is a, 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 also, the other thing is, I believe this, at the back of the houses, the, they are gardens, they are maybe a garage, whatever it is, but I feel that this building the house here will introduce other people to wanting to do the same. It is too claustrophobic, and I, I'm just, I, I am just very unhappy at this time. If this plan was to go ahead, I will be so disappointed because it will change the whole view from the back of my house. You know, it's just the lighting will be definite. No matter how much how they angle and twist and turn that the, the, and build the thing, it will affect the lighting in the mornings, in the evenings. That's how I'm feeling. I'm sorry. And you know, the tree on the left, for me, it's been there for so many years. I'm. I. It, it's not going to be the same. It just will not be the same. And also, my neighbour, who is not on the on the on the, uh, you're not able to speak to my neighbour at present. To my left, a uh, gentleman named Skeet, who just recently lost his wife. He's also very disturbed by by all of this. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Maloney. Thank you. Okay, we also have the agent. I believe is speaking. Chris Foley, are you here? Hello, I am. Thank you. You've got uh, three minutes, please. Thank you. Good evening. I'm the architect for the Cooper's Lane application. Uh, we were appointed by the applicant following the uh, withdrawal of the previous scheme by another architect, which has been mentioned. Um, this is a project to redevelop an unsightly and underutilised site uh, to create two new houses near Leighton Midland Overground Station. Cooper's Lane and the surrounding area are predominantly residential with terrace houses on both sides of this road. Application site and the 10 adjacent properties which form the stretch of Cooper's Lane are uncharacteristic of this area. They're made up of a mix of um, rear boundary fences and private garages. Application um, site sits between two story terrace houses on one side and single story garages on the other. The proposals are to re replace the existing garages and reinstate the pavement to provide two two bedroom houses. Due to the proximity to local transport, the development is to be car free and as such will not result in an increase in traffic. The proposals are to be set back from the road to provide a small front garden and space for refuse and recycling bins. And as, as has been said, their houses are designed in accordance with national, London plan and local authority internal space standards. Um, the uh, scale of proposals strikes a balance between the need to match the character of the existing Victorian properties adjacent and the need to provide decent ceiling heights whilst also keeping the building as low as possible to avoid overshadowing. The front elevation is designed to complement the character of the terraced houses in the street without mimicking or creating a pastiche. Vertical windows are proposed with similar uh, proportions and rhythms to neighbouring properties. And the proposals reference local architectural features, including recessed doorways paired under decorative arches, the ground floor windows grouped in pairs with central column. Daylight is provided to the rear bathroom and internal stair via obscure uh, roof lights, which point to the sky only. Um, the houses have been set back away from the rear boundary so that the existing garage walls can be reduced in height slightly to allow more sunlight and daylight into the joining gardens 
and reduce the overall enclosing effect of the existing garden uh, garage walls. Whilst the BRE guidance indicates that the proposals are unlikely to affect the daylight and sunlight to adjoining properties, we understand that concerns were raised through the consultation process about the potential impact of the proposals. We have responded to these concerns and worked with the planning department to develop revised proposals which are much reduced at the rear of the first floor to ensure that there's no impact on neighbouring property. The revised scheme which is being considered today is significantly reduced and has no first floor rear facing windows to ensure there's no loss of daylight, sunlight or privacy due to potential overlooking. As a result, the proposals have the full support of the planning department and provide an excellent opportunity to create two new dwellings in an area well served by local transport and amenities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Foley. OK, um, officers, Teodora, are you going to respond to the, um, the, the comments okay. and questions that have arisen? Um, yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I want to clarify that uh, the first planning application for this site was not refused. It was actually withdrawn, which is different because uh, it means that planning uh, decision was not made um, for the previous proposal. Second, the site is independent plot of land fronting Corpus Lane. As such, policy DM4 for back backland sites is not really applicable in this case. In terms of loss of light, I'm really sorry, but I'll have to repeat myself. The Urban Design SPD recommends a minimum clearance of 12 meters between the window of a habitable room and the blank flank wall of an opposing two-story building. The eaves height of the proposed dwellings is four meters, and the, sorry, it's four meters close to the boundary with properties on Brewster Road. And the separation distance between the application site and properties on Brewster Road is 11 meters. Now, given the scale and proportions of the dwellings, it's unlikely the development would result in a significant loss of light to habitable rooms. And therefore, a daylight and light assessment was not required in this case. Um, in terms of outlook, the eaves height of the proposed dwelling again is approximately four meters in height um, at a distance of three meters from the rear boundary with Bristol Road. Um, there is a garage adjacent to the site and um, the proposed development would be 1.3 meters higher than the adjacent garage building. Um, given the scale and proportions of the buildings, it is not considered that the development the development would um, be uh, of, of such a big scale to be considered over, overbearing in this case. Uh, in terms of privacy, again, I'm really sorry, but I have to repeat myself. The Urban Design SPD advises that uh, a minimum distance of 20 meters is required be between opposing windows of habitable, room, habitable rooms. Um, in this case, views from the ground floor win windows would be restricted by the proposed two meter um, high boundary treatment. Um, the windows in the first floor serve a landing and a bathroom and are obscured and therefore removing the uh, potential for overlooking. In terms of noise and disturbance, uh, noise will remain residential in nature and therefore is considered acceptable. Um, I also would like to remind that our noise officer reviewed the application and did not raise any objections on noise grounds. Um, in terms of private amenity space, the proposed development would provide 25, each, each dwelling would provide 25 square meters of private amenity space um, and would fail to comply with the local private amenity space standard of 50 square meters. Um, policy DM7 advises that the council will take flexible approach when applying the external space standards. In this case, the external amenity space is well designed, appropriately located and usable. 25 square meters of private garden would allow for a variety of amenity space functions to meet the needs of future residents. Thank you. I think I addressed it all, but if I've forgotten something, please remind me. Thank you, Teodoro. Thanks a lot. That was very comprehensive. Thank you. OK, um, councillors. None of you have your hands up yet. Who wants to to speak first? Keith. Councillor Rayner. Thank you, Chair. Just just so I, I, I keep with the general theme this evening, can somebody describe to me exactly where the dustbins are going to be stored? Because I can't work it out on either the maps or on the description within the report. <laughs> Has have any um, of the other two councillors got any questions as well? 
Yeah, Alan, Councillor Sears. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I don't, um, not questions per se. Um, there have been stories at the front, Keith, in, in basically in, in what's left of the front garden. Um, <clears throat> okay, in pure planting terms, um, there really is not much to oppose this. Um, <clears throat> it's street property, that's point one. Um, I have to say, when I first saw it, I thought it was, I thought the, the resident as in Brewster Road had got together, chopped the end of their guy. There's a development taking place that way, but clearly that land's been sold off at some point in in uh, in its history, and now it's it's going to be redeveloped. There are no windows to the rear, uh, which would um, obviously overlook the rear gardens. So overlooking from a point of view of uh, both. Uh, future occupiers and neighbours le is less of an issue. Um, I'm not going to say it's no issue, but it is less of an issue. Um, you have to work quite hard to see into the into, into your neighbours' gardens. That's and that's actually true in both directions um, because of the distance of the rear garden of the property in Brewster Road. Assuming a 1.8 metre fence, it would actually be quite difficult because of the narrowness of the of the garden and narrowness. Well, sorry, the lack of depth of the rear garden um, in the proposal. It's not quite the same. Um, I mean, the space is an issue. Um, it's um, <laughs> Theodora said, well, it's it's well designed. With it's it's a it's a small rectangle, but you know, it's one of those things. It is. It's a lot more usable than the last ones we looked at. Also, this one um, there is provision in the London plan that if there is amenity space, I can't remember the distance, but it's, it's if there is public amenity space quite close, that there that there is a a trade off, if you like, and just. The, uh, at the end of Brewster Road, there is a very large park and uh, what is Lake Cricket Ground, I think. Um, so in pure planning terms, it's very difficult to find grounds to, to, to refuse this one. Um, I understand there's a world of difference for the occupiers of Brewster Road in having a garage at the end of their garden and suddenly you've got a house. But the overlooking issues aren't there because there are no windows at, at first floor level to the, to the rear and it's impossible to see the other way too. Um, I live in a house, you know, as many of you probably do, with a garden at the end of your garden. You know, it's one of those things that happens from time to time. Um, it's awkward when that changes and it's unpleasant when it changes. You know, as human beings, we tend to be resistant to change. But, you know, we are a planning committee and we are here to consider, um, you know, planning regulations. And I can't really see that we have much in the way of grounds to uh, refuse this one. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Siggers. Councillor Pye. Thank you very much. I, I just have one quick question and then um, some comments. I just wondered, I need to understand properly why a daylight and sunlight uh, assessment wasn't undertaken. Uh, I think it. I think um, Teodora said it was because the flank wall was 11 metres away, but I thought the threshold was 12 metres. I may well have understood that misunderstood that so I just wanted to check what exactly what happened around that and the reasons behind it but aside from that I have to say that whilst I I really appreciate the concerns of the local residents and I can completely understand the position from where they're coming from I have to agree with Councillor Siggers there are no planning grounds for um, refusing this there's a there's a bit of an issue with the amenity space um, but 
on you know we have to look at planning balance we we have you know a predilection to sustainable development we have a whole set of planning rules um unfortunately if something merely doesn't meet one relatively small element when you've got three parks within jumping distance then that isn't enough grounds to for refusal and we are bound by those planning rules um, rather than by our particular sympathies with how people feel about things and the impact there will be on them so um, I would unless there is a dramatic response to my question about daylight and sunlight I would tend to agree with Councillor Siggers Thank you Councillor can you come back on, on those issues, please? Oh, Thank thanks a lot. Yes, of course. So, um, as I said previously, the separation distance in the SPD is 12, 12 metres. Now, the exact distance between the rear wall of properties on Brewster Road and the new dwelling is 11.4 metres. But there's one thing we should consider. The dwelling, if you look at it at the back, is not full two storeys in height. The eaves height is four metres, and therefore, the separation distance of approximately 11.4 meters or approximately 11 meters is considered acceptable. Now, um, we would usually ask for daylight and light impact assessment when there is an issue and we're not quite sure and we can see that there would be an impact on a um, neighboring community. In this case, there is no impact and there is no justification for me to go back and ask the agent to provide a daylight and light impact assessment. Thank you. That makes perfect uh, sense. Thank you, Theodora. Thanks a lot. I was just going to jump in and say also the uh, proposed development is to the north of the properties on Brewster Road. So they will be less likely to have an impact on the on the daylight sunlight received as well. Thank you. Um, Councillor Rayner, are you satisfied with um, where the bins are situated in these plans? Yes, Chair, with the able help of Councillor Siggers, I found the dustbins. <laughs> OK. Who has their hand up still? Mari? I would, um, if it's all right with you, Chair, like to move officers recommendations. Is anyone prepared to second that? Councillor Siggers, thank you. Um, Justin, can you just summarise what we're voting for? I think it's fairly plain, but was there one, should we note the amendments to the report that, that um, Teodora gave us earlier? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, yes, yeah, so the me members are um, recommended to grant consent for the development um, as described in the report, subject to um, the Section 106 agreement and conditions, including um, the amendments as set out in the update report. Thank you very much. OK, let's let's have a vote. Um, we're voting to um, accept the officer's recommendation. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much, committee. Thank you, officers. And thank you to the speakers who came today. Thank you. That closes the committee for thank this evening. Chair. Thank you very much, Chair. Ably done. Thank you, Councillor Rayner. And, um, oh, I think Jenny's gone already. Okay. No, I, 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 we, we <laughs> no still Jenny's sit, but, still there. I think okay. Jenny's there. Is Jenny going to come back? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> I'll put my video back on. Yeah, I mean, I didn't um, stay in the room for the... Um, uh, presentation in the meeting, but thank you very much, Sally, for taking over from me. That's my pleasure. Um, she did a very good so, job. You better watch out, Chair. <laughs> oh, okay. That was I a will. far easier um, decision than, than the other one, believe me. <coughs> right. Are you still, rec are you still recording, um, whoever? Yeah, I think, I think we haven't...